All right. You guys ready for the word today? All right. Everybody say the mechanics of the presence of God. The mechanics of the presence of God. Now, today's going to be good, but it's going to be a little challenging, but that ain't no different than any other Sunday, all right? So this is part four, a principle of the presence. I'm going to teach you one of the principles of the presence, and a lot of times we don't realize that this is happening, but it's for a good thing, and the princi- one of the principles, not the only one, Mr. Pam, but one of the principles of the presence is letting go. Yes. It's going to be big. Everybody say letting go. So we are learning so much about the presence. How many of y'all are growing? How many of you guys are growing in, your, in, the, in thinking about the, how the presence of God operates? But more important, good to see you, Keith, is making it a priority. The presence of God needs to be a priority over everything else that you do. If you're new to this church, if you're new to God, when you wake up in the morning, your thoughts should be about him because when you wake up in the morning, his thoughts are about you. With 7 billion people in the planet, Rachel, all over the world, God is thinking about you when your eyes open. Isn't that magnificent? The Bible says that he catches your tears in a bottle. So when you're sad, when things are going on, my, my, God is catching your tears in a bottle. He labels it and he stores it because he's going to make sure he answers the reason for that tear. The Bible says that God knows all the hairs on your head. Watch it. You said, when it comes to me, it's easy. Huh, Bob? It's easy. (laughs) Hey, Bob, he ain't got a count. It's just right there. But God loves us. But you know what he wants? He wants us to love him back. And that's all we're talking about. So um, last week, how many of y'all were here last week? All replacements for the presence collapsed. It was big. So if you replace something, Priscilla, If you replace the presence of God with something or someone, there will be a collapse. It's a divine principle because God's not going to let you be happy outside of his creative order. Do you all understand that? People say, well, how come God doesn't do this, Nicole? How come God doesn't do that? You know why? Because he's not going to let us be happy outside of his intended purpose. The Bible says in Isaiah 46.10 that God declares the end from the beginning. And when God is declaring the end from the beginning, he already knows what he wants, Jacob. He already knows what he is expecting. And if you and I veer off and pick something outside of the presence of God, he's going to let that thing collapse. Does this make sense? And it's one of the reasons so many Christians are struggling in the same repetitive patterns, but we're going to deal with that today. So this week's not going to be any easier. Everybody say letting go. Now, I'm going to teach. We're only going to look at one story today, but it's going to be powerful. But we're going to look at some stuff, Minister Mike, in the story that, excuse me, that most of the time doesn't actually come out. So this is really important. And most people don't acknowledge this, Bobby, but this is huge, okay? So repeat after me. All doing comes from being. No being comes from doing. What? This is huge, and I'm going to tell you over sex, drugs, rock and roll, and rap. I got to add rap in there from the 80s, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Now it's rap, too. People highlight sins that are obvious. But they don't really look at, none of us do, sins of the heart that aren't. If you're an alcoholic stumbling down the street, everybody knows you have a drinking problem. But if you're an unforgiving, bitter person, nobody will know unless they're close to you. So Christians have become professional hiders. It's like hide and seek. Layla, is that you? No, yes. Is that you? Oh, stand up. I'm ADD, you know. How was your trip? I saw all your pictures. Tell them real loud, yell real loud, where'd you go? To take care of kids. I'm so proud of you. 
Come on, y'all can do better than that. She let go of everything here and went and served people, and I saw all the pictures. I think you're amazing. I can't see because of all these Hollywood lights. I was like, does she look like Layla? All right, come on, give her a hand clap. Thank you, dear. Okay, so, so the principle of letting go is this, and what I just said, I know it's kind of confusing. The number one sin, and this is important, and people don't realize this because it isn't obvious. The number one sin, other than rejecting Jesus, is trying to work your way to heaven when Jesus has already worked. You say, uh uh, drinking is worse, smoking is worse, killing is worse. No, it isn't, because more people go to hell, Jason, trying to earn their salvation. Are y'all listening? It's been like this since the beginning. And let me tell you why it's the number one sin, because it's the number one thing that took the devil down. What took the devil down, what took Satan down, was pride. Everybody say pride. pride. Thinking he was something more than what God had created him to be and wanting something that God didn't want him to have. Now watch. Pride is when you and I, James, we don't receive the finished work of Jesus on the cross. When Jesus said it is finished, he didn't mean you need to go work and earn extra credit so you can go to heaven. I know. No, this is a deeper concept today. So what happens is everybody starts working their way to a place they've already got a ticket and reservation. Ralph, it makes no sense. But the devil tricks people to work their way into religion by doing stuff, that's why you make New Year's resolutions. Come on. It's why we're fixated on behavior and we're not fixated on the, on the position of our heart toward God. This ain't, don't make sense? It's called works-based righteousness. Now, you know why we do it? That's good, Kathy. We want to look good, but there's a deeper reason why we do it. Just stay with me. I'll take you somewhere today. We don't want to let go. And we don't want to receive something from God so we don't owe him. Oh, boy, I slipped that in. If somebody does something for you, Brooke, then you're like, ah, I got to do something back. So, so listen. Salvation is free. Other religions make you work for it. Have you know? Other, look at them. They're all works-based. And this is why I'm trying to tell you. There are more people, Dana, in hell because they were trying to be good and trying to do the right thing instead of being the right thing. I know. But if you'll listen... It's at the basis of all reoccurring habits that we can't seem to beat. The reason you can't beat a certain thing, or I have some stuff I'm trying, to, I'm trying to beat. So all of us have things we're trying to get rid of and let go of. And that's why the presence is the most important thing in the process, but we don't teach that. We teach go to counseling. We teach do better. Come on, y'all. We teach all these different things, Kathy, and they don't transform us they only change us and the problem with changing is you change back when you're transformed a caterpillar cannot come back after he's become a metamorphosized butterfly he can't go back crawling does this make any sense so it's hard for us and this is the hardest concept and this is why the devil thrives with religion he gets everybody busy working Bob, he gets everybody busy doing, and we end up missing, are y'all ready, who we're working for. Okay, since this doesn't look like it's going over so well. Men, raise your hand. Here's the biggest trap for us. Keep it up. Working for your family so hard, you forget your family. Put your hands down. Now, does that make it a little bit better? 
Huh? Huh? Moms, lift your hand if you're a mom in here. You, you got to be careful that you don't have your kids so busy that they miss what's important. It's quiet today in this Catholic church. Because I told you, today's rougher because it's more reflective. And I know I'm wearing you out. I was thinking this week on the airplane, I'm going to do something easy for a couple weeks so you don't have to leave here with an assignment. Because <laughs> it's hard to come to Abundant Living. You got all this work to do. But listen, it's easy when you're doing to forget, Latoya, who you're doing it for. And when you and I forget who we're doing it for, that puts us outside of the presence, Troy, of who we're doing it for. And if we're outside the presence of Jesus, the stuff we're working for and with will collapse. All right. Well. No, don't clap. Don't try to make me feel good. All right. Are y'all ready? Let me just jump into it. The rich young ruler wanted eternal life. So we're going to read him today, but we're going to break it down. He wanted eternal life. He approached Jesus. Watch, Mr. Pam. It's going to be deep today. The rich young ruler wanted eternal life, but there is no eternal life without the presence. Now, just stop. And most people don't make this connection, Miss Judy. If you want to go to heaven, you are saying you want to live, watch this, not just not on earth. You want to live, Miss Rosemary, in the presence of God. But here's what you're saying, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Now, can I be honest? Look at the hypocrisy in all of us. Oh, God, I want to live in heaven. I want to go to heaven when I die so I can be with you, be around you 24 hours a day, seven days a week. But while I'm down here, you get 90 minutes a week. Isn't that tough? Is it true? Is it true? Because we have inflated our life with things that we're so busy with that have nothing to do with Jesus, have nothing to do with the presence of God. And so how do you reconcile, how do I reconcile that 90 minutes a week is enough down here, but the minute a drunk driver or a disease takes my life, all of a sudden I'm ready to be with Jesus 24 hours a day. So the rich young ruler wanted eternal life. But Jesus is going to say something, and it's what I opened up with. As a Christian, all of our being, who we are to be, our being can never come from doing. What we do should always come from who we be. Who we be. If not, the doing has a wrong motive. So, <laughs> y'all should look and see y'all. It's hard up here. People are like, <laughs> no, you ain't, James. So Jesus asked him to do something. But Pastor Mark, didn't you just say all being can't come from doing? Uh-huh, but doing exposes your being. Oh, uh, watch. Uh-oh, we got communion again. Give us a break, y'all, today. We're having some technical demons uh, running around our church and electricity and the Internet. So the devil can't stop us, though, right? Because we don't stop and we don't quit unless we are otherwise directed by God. And I didn't get a text from Jesus this morning. All right, so if you have your Bibles, open your Bible to the book of Matthew, chapter 19. If you don't, it's going to be up here on the screen. But bring your Bibles so you don't know if I'm lying to you or not. One time y'all going to come to church, I'm going to preach a whole sermon that's a lie. And, and if you don't have your Bible, you ain't going to know it. <laughs> and then I'm going to say at the end, just kidding. Okay, now watch. Now behold, one came and said to him, who's him? Jesus, we're going to break it down because this is all we got today. So we're going to get you out a little bit earlier. So one came and said to Jesus, good teacher. So here's where he messed up right away. He's flattering Jesus. Good teacher. What good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? 
Do you see that, that sentence right there, Jason, those sentences? Say and declare everything I just told you. You got to make sure that you're not trying to be good. So let me say this, Ron. This is bigger. You can do good, but your focus should not to be good. Mark these words. Here's what will happen to you, and you already know I'm telling the truth. If your focus is being good, when you mess up, you can't be, Ron just said, because the whole Old Testament is set up with the Ten Commandments to show you you can't be good without the Savior. Do y'all realize that? The Ten Commandments, Miss Shirley, the whole Old Testament is to point you in the direction of of a savior because you can't save yourself. This is big. So everybody is fooled into if I'm good enough, I'll go. You can never be good enough. I tell you all the time, if you're good Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, we'll send you to heaven Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, but you're going to hell Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday because you can't keep it up. And God knew you and I couldn't keep it up. But the rich young ruler, because he's got money, ready, Doug? He's been rewarded by the world system. Watch this. He's got money. Now, it doesn't mean he's bad, but he's got money. He's got a lot of stuff. So he thinks he's more than he actually is. Because, Josh, he's been paid or he's received money from doing something. And he's getting ready to lay out how good and rich and why he's good and rich. So he brings that same mentality to Jesus. Good teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? So he's admitting that you get eternal life through doing good and being good. Okay? Now watch. Verse 17. So he said to him, why do you call me good? So right away, Jesus is reorientating the conversation. He's like, first of all, you're coming at me twisted. So let's fix it because I'm not going to keep having a conversation in the wrong bucket. So, but I love Jesus. Jesus teaches by discovery, Tiffany, meaning he asks questions. He don't just tell you what to do. So he'll ask you a question. So he comes back and says, huh, it's interesting choice of words. So why do you call me good? And then he comes and quantifies it. No one is good but one. That is God. But if you want to enter into life or eternal life, what did Jesus say? So, and that sounds like the opposite of what I just said, right? So, why would Jesus say, hey, if you want to go to eternal life, do something? Is he playing a trick? Hmm? He needs to expose that doing something doesn't lead to eternal life. Doing something doesn't lead to eternal life because Jesus knows he's getting ready to go did something. You say did something, that's not the right tense. Yes, it is because before Jesus came, he had already done everything he was going to do. He just had to come do it in front of us. Him and the Father already had it worked out. He said to him, verse 18, which ones? So now Jesus got him caught up in his own thinking. So he said, you call me good. There's none good but God. But let's just stop for a second. That's because God is a spirit, and you must worship him in a spirit as in truth, and nothing good is in this. This can't hold a good person. Come on, talk to me. God is good because God is a spirit. So let's keep going. So he said, which ones? Jesus said, now this is huge, and a lot of people that read the story haven't looked at it this way, and I want to give you something. Jesus said, okay. I'm going to list the Ten Commandments because remember, the New Testament isn't written yet. It's being written with these stories. So all Jesus can refer to is the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, the first five books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, it's called the Pentateuch, are buried the Ten Commandments in the book of Exodus. So that's the first time through these Ten Commandments that God reveals his nature to people. Now, God is way more than the Ten Commandments, but he's trying to give humans something they can strive for to realize they can't do it. So he says stuff like, honor your father and mother. Well, that's out. 
right? So watch. Jesus follows the thinking, Pam, but he's trying to get him to see something that he don't see. And he's trying to get us to see something. So Jesus said, thou shalt not murder. Well, that's an easy one, right? Check. You shall not commit adultery. That's an easy one. You shall not steal. That's not so easy. You shall not bear false witness. That means lie. And then he comes back to number five, honor your father and your mother. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now, the last one is not one of the Ten Commandments, but Jesus said, loving God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and loving your neighbor as yourself encompasses all of the commandments. Because if you love your neighbor like you're supposed to love yourself, you won't steal from them, lie to them, and take their wife or husband. Now, are you with me? Now, here's what people don't know. You ready, Mr. Mike? Jesus just listed the bottom half of the commandments. But here's the revelation. He didn't list the first three. How many of y'all, you see it? Don't put no other God before me. Don't make any graven image of me, number two. What's number three? Don't use my name in vain. Top three. You ready? Why would Jesus focus in on the human interaction ones and never bring up being in the presence of God, relating to God through relationship, not through doing stuff. You got to come. Come on. He's setting them up. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So then the young man comes back because he ain't learned nothing yet. All these things I have kept from my youth. What do I still lack? Even though he knows He's done all these things, which I don't believe him because he's lying right now, okay? So even though he comes and says, I've done all this stuff, his heart is still condemning him. Okay, now watch. You ready, Corky? On the top three. Because Psalm says God has written his law on all of our hearts. Some of you say, well, how can you go to heaven if you don't ever hear about Jesus? Because you don't violate the law that's on your heart. Somebody in some way off country has never heard the gospel. God's going to judge them based on the law he has written on the hearts. It's in the book of Romans. So watch. He says, I've done all these different things, but Jesus has hidden the top three because he knows the top three is his problem. Y'all, come on. That's pretty good. So his heart says, we've done all this stuff, but what do we lack? Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, so I know his heart registered before his words. Ah. Jesus said to him, if you want to be perfect, perfect in the the Greek means complete. We already talked about that. It means complete. So if you want to be complete, here it is. What's today about letting what? Okay, now watch this. This is big. If you want to be complete, go sell what you have. That's the first let go. So Jesus said, I'll make the first let go easy, Mama Shirley. I'll let you get some money for it. So let your stuff go. Second, go sell what you have and give to the poor. Now he has to give to the poor, and he don't get no money from that. So I'll let you go get some money, okay? But then the money that you get, give that to people they can't pay you back. And then my heavenly father, the top three commandments, will see you, and he'll reward you, and he'll let you store up stuff in heaven. The problem is you can't access it right now. So now I'm testing you. Because you have everything. You're rich. You think you got it going on because you do everything right. So let's see what you do when you don't get something back yet. I'm going somewhere. And give to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven. Delayed. And then come, follow me. Do you know what follow me means? This is important. Watch, it's the same concept, Jamie, I said about heaven. We don't think about it like this. Come, follow me means be in my presence. 
You wait till next week. Next week is I don't know why we think worship is just music. Ooh, wait till you hear next week. So he says to him, come follow me. Come on earth, please get it, and be in my presence all the time. The disciples are with me all the time. You came to me. I didn't come to you. You want eternal life. The Bible says eternal life is knowing God the Father and knowing Jesus Christ, his son, not just living forever. You came to me and told me you want, watch this, Pam, to be in my presence. See, when we read the story, we just think about eternal life after death. Jesus is like, no, 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 no. I'm talking about right here, right now. Y'all follow me. So then what happens? But when the young man heard that saying, what happened? He did what? He went away sorrowful from the presence of Jesus. Where did he go away from? Who did he run from? Are you listening? So when he heard he had to do something, Because doing never fulfills you. When he heard he had to do something else that he wasn't in control of, he went away from Jesus, the one he had been talking to about spending all his time with. Do y'all hear the hypocrisy? And it's in us too. If you don't have a day time of worship and presence, and reading, especially now with your phone that'll read the Bible to you. Stop fooling yourself that you're going to make it 24 hours a day, seven days a week, saying holy, 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 like those angels do in heaven right now. There are angels that worship and say holy, 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 24 hours a day, seven days a week. There's so much in God that they can be thankful for, they just never stop saying it. And then God asks us, spend some time with me today. Excuse me, I'm on X. Excuse me, I got a post on Instagram. Excuse me, my kids have 69 events. Excuse me, I've got to go to the gym. Excuse me, all those things are not bad, but they have to be measurable and incommensurate with spending time with Jesus. All I'm saying is don't replace the presence with other things that you think are important because those things don't make it past your last breath. That's all I'm saying. And it's a message to church. We're not preaching that. We're preaching all this culture stuff. We're preaching all these different things. We're preaching all this personal development stuff. But we're not telling people you must be in love with Jesus first. We're not saying that. So then all these other things collapse, and then the people come back and blame God because of the collapse. Oh, this is not going well. He went away sorrowful from the presence of Jesus, whom he said he wanted to be around, for he had great possessions. Now, are you ready? Here's the bottom line. We're almost done. The presence of God. And I could give you story after story. Are you ready? It's a principle that we don't think about. Requires letting go. I've never heard teaching on that. Have you, Aaron? You sit in the presence, you're going to have to let go of something. Now, can I go deeper, a little tougher? Sometimes sitting in the presence requires you to let go of someone. Now, if you're married, you're stuck, it sucks. <laughs> no, because people are just getting in the parking lot. See, I told you. <laughs> the pastor said, bye, sucker. You try to work it out. Come on now. Now, as much, the Bible says as much as it's up to you. If the other person don't, then you can't control that. But are y'all listening to me? I've never heard a message like this. And I'm going to give you some examples. When, I, when I'm sitting in the presence, Priscilla, God is taking something from me. Can I be more honest? You already know what I'm teaching. That's why you don't go.
I'm teaching something you've experienced but not labeled. So today I'm labeling it, which is why today is rough. You know in moments of your life, if you're a Christian, if you're not a Christian, this doesn't make sense to you. If you're a Christian, you know that the closer you got to God, things and people start dropping off. Yes or no? Yes or no? And, and, and that did not feel good. So here's what the devil said. See, that's what you get for praying. That's what you get for going to church. Come on. That's what you get for joining that church. That's what you get for reading. What's your God doing for you now? He did the same thing to Adam and Eve. What, what's God doing for you? Trying to keep something from you? You got to hear me. The devil will tell you outside of the presence of God that God's trying to keep something from you. But I'm going to give you a hammer right now. But God's nature is always trying to get something to you. Hand me the tissue box, Randy. Watch, watch. Now, hand me those mints. Just watch. Just hand me the whole thing. I want you to hand them to me. No, the whole thing. Yeah, just hand them to me. That's nasty. So you walk around life with your bottle of water. You walk around life with your tissue box. God trying to tell you your breath stink. He's trying to get something to you so you don't kill everybody. And then it's hard because that's... Oh. Stop. 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 My poor little life. That mint is my children. That mint is my marriage. That mint is my job. That mint is my mental health. That mint is my physical health. What, what, God, why you let my life be all scattered on the stage? Because he told you to let go of something. You can't hold everything tight. You got to hold stuff loosely, bro. Because, because, because God is always trying to upgrade you. But some people like they water and tissue. But you want to be in everybody's face, but your breath stinks. And the problem is you can't smell your own breath. So you have to get in the presence of God for God to reveal to you, you have halitosis. But we all live with halitosis because we don't think our breath stink. We don't think other stuff stink too, but I'm going to leave it alone because it's church. And God is like, I need you to come in here so I can reveal something to you. And when I'm talking to you, I need, y'all don't want me today. I need you to let some stuff go. And you're trying to hold on to everything, and you holding on to the stuff that I didn't give you. The, the relationship, not the marriage, the relationship I didn't give you. Because God will bless the covenant, but it just takes more work if God didn't give you the covenant partner. Well, that was balanced. I'm trying to tell you, let go of what's in your hand because my nature is to keep blessing you. But your life, I'm going to leave them up here so you can see. But your life is scattered all over the stage. Because you've not been taught and you've not actualized that in the presence, I'm requiring something from you. Jesus required something from that boy. And the boy was in love with what Jesus was trying to take. Are you ready? Sometimes you think you're obeying a commandment and you're not. You want to know something else in the scripture we miss? Jesus said, go sell your stuff. Watch this. Watch. We're almost done. Go sell your stuff and then do what with it? No, give it to who? You've been rich all this time. Got neighbors who are poor. 
and you ain't been giving it up. So you just told me you've kept all these things from your youth. You just lied and broke the other one you said you didn't break. So if God is first, and if you don't worship another idol, and if you don't take his name in vain, and you have your relationship with his presence first, it's easier to do the other seven. But church and nonprofits and religions convince you the other seven are more important than the top three. So here are the benefits of letting go in his presence. Number one, ready, Jason? God is not taking from us. That is not his nature. Nature in the Greek is the word thusis, and it means the prevailing tendencies on which you structured your life. God has prevailing tendencies, love, mercy, come on, come on, forgiveness, on which he structured his whole entire life and his kingdom. It's against God's nature to take stuff from you that you need. Need. God takes the stuff you want that actually have an adverse impact on where he's taking you. Okay, stop. You can marry the wrong person and derail your whole calling. And don't look at me like that. God can do all things through Christ. Uh Uh-huh, but people don't. And I can give you 100 examples of people not fulfilling their call because they was in the flesh when they got hooked up with somebody. He is always trying to get something to us. Now watch this. So we have to let go so we have the ability to receive something new, Frank. Can I just be blunter? You don't know your breath stinks. Is that, am I being honest? Unless you go like this. And if you do this enough, you still don't know. Because you say, oh, it smelled like yesterday. That's because you didn't brush your teeth today. I'm telling the truth. Sonia, we don't know we smell because you get used to your smell. The presence of God The Bible says that it will divide. That's why you have to read daily. It'll divide the soul and the spirit. It'll separate them. And in your spirit is your conscience, your intuition, and your communion. And when you read the Bible, watch this, Lucian. The Bible will separate what's in your spirit, that is God, from what's in your soul, which is the world. And then once you see yourself in the mirror, the Bible says when you're reading the Bible, it's like beholding yourself in a mirror, You then see, oh, I forgot. Ladies, you look in the mirror so you can make sure your makeup is correct. You don't just put your makeup on driving, well, some of y'all do, right? And then you get to work and everybody say, why do you look like the Joker? I'm playing. But I'm just saying, you look, you look. Some of y'all don't watch superhero movies, so you know what I'm saying. You put your mirror on so you can actually see your own reflection. The Word of God daily shows you your own reflection and reveals to you what you need to let go. Ah. And if you let it go, you position Jesus to actually answer your prayer. But most of us are sitting here with unanswered prayers because we sit here and we don't keep our appointments in the presence. And because we don't keep our appointments in the presence of God, in the Word of God, every single day we wait on Sunday, we miss six days of letting go and want to come up to an altar for 20 minutes and they better hurry up and want God to fix everything that's scattered all over the stage. He's like, I'm not fixing it because you dropped it. And you dropped it because you wouldn't let go when I was trying to bring it to you. When I was trying to bless you, you kept holding on to stuff I didn't ordain, stuff I didn't give you. So I'm going to allow a break. I'm going to allow a pause because you have made that thing you're holding on to an idol. And thou shalt have no other God before me because it keeps you out of my presence. So I'm not playing with you. 
I'm going to let stuff be scattered until you figure out I want to be with you every day. So here we go. We're done. I don't know how else to say this, Ann. This is the biggest thought I've had in a long time. And it was rough us getting started. In the presence of God, oh, we will be asked to let go of what we love so that he can get us what he loves. Wait, 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 wait. What? Wait till next week, Genesis chapter 22. I'm going to preach this Abraham and Isaac and God saying, give me your son. You wait. We're going to find out, Adrian, that worship ain't music at all. It's obedience. <laughs> and if you'll love me, you'll keep my commandments. You'll worship me. Because <sighs> worship is not singing. Singing is an instrument to my presence, but worship is not just singing. Worship is obedience. Worship is you doing what, you, what I tell you to do because you told me you love me. Ah, wait till next week. Miguel, when I come into the presence, I got to be ready to let go. And I love some of the stuff he wants me to give up. Karen, that's the hardest ones. But he's saying, I, I, I want to give you the mints. I'm the water. You don't need a bottle of water. You have a whole fountain. Living water. He's trying to get stuff to us that he loves, but we've not made room because we're holding so tight to stuff we think and people we think we need and the truth is, you don't. I know. This was rough. So here's my last example. So for me, because so you don't think I'm just yelling at you all the time. Randy, you can come get him now. I, uh, you've heard my testimony enough, so I don't need to talk about my testimony. But... I've had a rough, like, couple of months. Um, I am not the type of person, uh, what's the word? I can let stuff go, and it, it, is, that, is that true? I can let stuff go. So I have a gift to let stuff go. You can't pastor and not let stuff go, because people you help hurt you. It happens every week. It happens every week. If I told y'all half the stories here, you'd be like, what? You do good by people, and then they do stuff to you. But that's fine. My problem is not letting stuff go. My problem is not slapping you on the way out. I'm being honest. I don't, I've always been this way since you know me. I'm a fighter. I, I, I'm a fighter. So I don't like Jesus taking over my battles. I just don't. Because I'm like, how they going to know it's you? If I get them, they know. <laughs> so listen to me. Listen to me. So this has been the last couple of months. Stuff has been coming at me from every direction. And I'm not in no sin. I'm not having sex with nobody. I don't have no porn addiction. I don't have none of that stuff that would cause me to be in the paper. I got stuff inside that won't be in the paper. I'm not going to lie to you. And I hate this scripture. Vengeance is mine, saith God. I can't stand that scripture. No, homie, vengeance is mine. Amen. You did that to me. And I, I can't express to you the pain level I'm in when I can't fight back. So God gave me a scripture, and guess where he gave it to me? In the presence. He said, I need you, he said, because you're acting up. He said, I need you to get this scripture, and I need you to say it all the time, all day long. And so the scripture is Proverbs 16, 7. If a man's ways please the Lord. This is how I get through all the bad things, and there have been some bad things. 
I sit in my prayer chair and I get in the presence and I say, Proverbs 16, 7, Father rules my life. If a man's ways please the Lord, watch, he will make even his enemies at peace with him. And I'm learning every day. Don't clap because it's not a good thing because I'm always on the edge. But I say it all the time, and then I'm learning, okay, God, I, don't, I can't pray away my enemies because I have an enemy. And my enemy, Diablos the dragon, is going to send enemies. But the Bible says, I wrestle not against flesh and blood, but I want to wrestle. What's up? So I can't because I'll break scripture. But what do I do, God, when they're, acting, when they're messing with me? What do I do when they're treating me bad? What do I do when they're coming at me? Man, I'm hot. I'm turned up. What do I do? Ugh. Watch, John. You're a police, so I have to tell you. If my ways are pleasing to the Lord, he'll make my enemies at peace with me. And I can't tell you some of the worst situations that have ever happened to me at this church and in my life. God took an enemy that was still an enemy, and this is a revelation to me, that was still an enemy and made that enemy calm down out of nowhere and be at peace with me. Watch, here's a revelation. Even though they were still my enemy. And you know what he said? He said, Mark, my scripture is the nature of my son, Jesus, because with this scripture, you don't have to fight. Wait, excuse me, God? Yeah, you might have an internal conflict, but if I make your enemy at peace with you, there's no reason to be violent. I didn't change them being your enemy. I just changed their posture to you. If, Mark, you please me, then how do I please you? Prayer every day, presence every day, word every day, intermittent fasting every day, telling my body no so my body is not in charge. Ever since I've been practicing those five things, I feel a calmerness. Can I just say that? I feel a, a calming in my spirit. I don't feel it if I do four. And I don't feel it if I do three. I'm just being honest. I, I have to do all five because all five handle my spirit and my soul and my body. Sometimes my spirit and soul are in agreement, but my body's not. So I have to, I fast from 8 o'clock at night till 12 in the noon. What am I doing? I want to eat, and I'm telling my body, no, you're not the boss. Now, I'm not telling you to do that. But I'm telling you I'm healthier. I'm telling you I feel better. I'm telling you I sleep better. And I'm telling you I can feel my body not being in charge. Prayer, presence, word, surrender, and sacrifice. I don't know what else to teach you. But the enemy is still the enemy. But God causes him not to come at me because I'm working on pleasing him. Then the scripture gets in. I'm God. I got your battles. You don't need to fight them. So it's helping my heart calm down and not proactively attack people that are heading towards me. Because I'm going to hit you first person. If I, if I smell that you're coming... Then we'll talk about it later. I made a mistake. I had a crook in my arm and it just. <laughs> and that's not a good thing. And God told me in the presence, and this is it. I need you to have the nature of my son. And right now, you don't have his nature. So I'm trying to have the nature of Jesus. Because guess what he didn't do? And he died for people that were attacking him. And I'm trying to be like that. But without the presence and letting go of this anger, this turned up, this I can handle it myself. God, you didn't do nothing when this happened. I got to let it go, Eric. And when I let it go, he brings something that he loves to me. And it's called peace. Come on, lift your hands. Come on, you get something today? Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask you to be with us. God, I don't know what else to do. I'm a work in progress, and I think 
I wish they had a little better pastor sometime, but I'm stuck sometime. And I'm working it through, and I just choose to preach my story as I work it through. I pray, Father, for every one of us here. Their prayer, presence, daily word, surrender, and sacrifice, telling our body no. It don't have to just be food, God. It could be entertainment. It could be music. We have to send a message every day that our body's not number one. And we're not taught that. So I thank you, Father, that these five attributes will live in abundant nation. And you're helping me. I'm not there yet, but I feel a peace and I feel calmer, God, because I don't feel like I'm embarrassing you with my actions and my thoughts. So please, Jesus, help us to let go in your presence so you can get to us what you love. If you're here today, and this message resonated with you. But here's the thing. If you know right now, think about it, don't stand up. If you know right now what or who you have to let go, stand to your feet. I'm going to pray for you. We don't think about it like this. And I'm just telling you, if you're standing up, there's something God's trying to get to you. But your hands are full. Your heart is full. God can break every addiction. He can break every bad relationship, but you got to be willing to let it go. And if you don't let go of this sin, you can't hold the blessing. You can't hold both. And we're not taught that. God today wants to do something magnificent, but he's asking you right now in his presence. You're in the presence of his word today and the presence of the song today. And he's asking you to let it go. You stood up because you already know what it is. For some of you, this message was a confirmation that this person or this thing I have are things I have to let go. And you can feel that I'm telling you the truth, that God is trying to get something to you, but your hands are full. So if you're standing up, do your hands like this. I want God, I, I need to let go of the retribution in me the revenge in me, and it's really just a pride. I want to let go of, I can handle things myself. Pastor Mark, don't let nobody help him. And anybody who's close to me already knows that. I don't let nobody help me. And that's not right. It's pride. But I don't want to be, I don't want to owe nobody nothing. I'm just going to tell you the truth. So I handle it myself. And God didn't design me to be that way. Father, in the name of Jesus, all the hands that are lifted high, Father, we're lifting our hands and we're giving you that thing or things that's hindering us from receiving from you what you love. But over our hands and over this thing and over the person, we give you our heart today that we will make room for your presence on a daily basis and we will be prepared in your presence to receive your love and receive what you have for us. But help us not to hang on and struggle. Father, for some of us, it's been tug of war. I hear you saying it's been a tug of war with my people. It's been a tug of war with my children. And God is saying, let go of the rope today. Let go of the rope today. I got you. You still win, but let go of the rope. God is saying he can do more, way more productive things with you versus fighting with you about the thing that's killing you. So today, God, we release it. All these habits we give to you, God, and it's not a miracle right now in this moment. It'll be a miracle if we do all five every day to seal this moment. We've got to have follow-up, and that's being with you every day, or this standing won't make a difference. So those of you that are standing, repeat after me. Dear Jesus, today I let go, and you know what that thing is. Don't say it out loud. I let go. And my heart and my hands are open to receive the gift or gifts you have for me. Forgive me for holding on to things you didn't give me. Lord Jesus, would you forgive me and all my sins? Would you come into my heart, give me a new one? so I can live for you. Today, I am forgiven 
And I let go. I love you, Jesus. Amen. Once again, I apologize for giving you weekly assignments. I didn't like it at school. I don't know why I'm doing it at church. But I love you, and Jesus requires stuff of people all the time. And I know my preaching is like that, but I want us to all be better. Is that okay? And we got to come here, and we need to leave with an assignment. And during the week, if we really are excited about what we say on Sunday and what we hear, we'll do it during the week. Because I, I just want all of us to go. If the rapture were to come, I want to be able to go and see all of you, and we all go together. Is that all right? So I, I'm not going to apologize for my preaching, but I apologize for how it affects people. Amen? Come on, give them a shout. If you stood up today and you're not involved in our journey program, you can lift your phone up and do the QR code. It'll give you seven weeks of scriptures and emails to sustain you. But the most important thing I can tell you, I'm going to get some banners made. I was thinking about that in prayer, about daily prayer, daily presence, daily word. Come on, y'all. Daily surrender and daily sacrifice. That's what we taught the men on that Thursday. Come on, men. That's how you become a lion and not just a man. These five are non-negotiables. You do that, or you can text the word journey to 760-706-7562. Amen?